Our next guests include the cast, creators, and executive producers of the critically acclaimed Stars hit comedy, Blind Spotting, a show that follows the story of a mother as she navigates raising her son after her partner is incarcerated. Joining us are co-creators Rafael Casal and David Diggs, the show's stars Jasmine Cephas Jones, Benjamin Earl Turner, Jalen Barron, Candace Nicholas Lipman, and executive producers Jess Wu Calder and Keith Kohler. And that's all the time we have. <laughs> See you yeah. Blind Spotting season two. Yeah, it is fantastic. I loved it. All right, uh, I'm very biased. Uh, anyone, anytime anyone rolls through from the Bay Area, we spend time flexing yes. our Bay Area cred. Yes. This is a very Bay Area show. Who here is from Bay Area and Bay Area adjacent? <laughs> <laughs> Let's name it. Who's here from the, who knows the 510 here? Yes, 510. 510. 510. Who remembers it when who we were 515? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a show that's set in Oakland. We're gonna get to Oakland, but first we have to go to Vancouver because four and a half years ago, me and co-executive producer and star Raphael met at Vancouver when we were both giving TED Talks because yes. we're fancy. Yes. And we fancy. both we both endured shitty tacos at the yeah, taco it truck. <laughs> it was unfortunate. It was unfortunate. Uh, we raced back to California. <laughs> we raced, but back in the day, uh, there was a movie. It was Blind Spot. You know, like it was about to blow up. And did you think, fast forward five years, that you would be on season two mm -hmm. of Blind Spotting at Stars with this crew and Helen Hunt, getting the love that you're getting oh, wow. for the story set in Oakland? <laughs> Yes, I always knew. Yeah. <laughs> That's your camera, uh, by the way. I knew. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, we talked about this a lot, but of course, like, we never really planned to do this series. And now, you know, the amazing thing is to look at this group of people and think, oh my God, we, not only did we make one season, but we just spent. I mean, we've only ever shot this show in the pandemic, so we kind of feel like the odds were against us in all ways. Right. But, um, but season two has been fantastic. I think season one was like, can we make a TV show? And season two was like, you know, how do oh, we, we how did? Do, we can we make did. it. We, we and know they what like that us. Is and they, they like it, and, and now we can elaborate on the idea and refine and perfect. And we're really, really proud of this season. Everybody killed it. Yeah. I saw the first three episodes. I wanted to see all eight, but I had 60 interviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. You're busy, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had small, you know, we had Deepak Chopra and, and uh, Jose Andres. You might have heard of them, William oh. Shatner. Up and coming young yeah, bucks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I saw three episodes, and the, the show, the second season expands the universe, expands the characters expands the lyrical poetry mm -hmm. of Oakland. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Oakland, it's a very intentional decision to set this in Oakland. And, and the term blind spotting for the kids who don't know, first of all, David, can you, can you define how the kids use the word blind spotting? How <laughs> the kids these days use the word blind spotting? <laughs> um, I hope they do, that'd be, that'd be amazing. Um, blind spotting is uh, <laughs> something we developed for the film that we wrote, which is based on the on the concept of Ruben's vase, which is there's a picture. Some people look at it and they see a vase, and some people see two faces. And what you see is based on your entire history before that. So it's about your prejudices. It's not that you can't see the other thing. It's that you are conditioned to see one thing. And if somebody tells you there's another thing there, you can work to see it. But you're locked in into one interpretation without you're even realizing. You're predisposed to one interpretation. And so. That's where Oakland pops, right? Because the predisposition of Oakland, uh, the misconceptions of Oakland, the community of Oakland, the things that happen to folks in Oakland, what is it that you wanted to do as an accurate representation of that city and the people in it? I think we are from a city that, like like many cities, like Austin, where we are now, is constantly in flux, right? And Gentrified, it, maybe, some would say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. But that's some. A, that's a, well, it's a complicated word, too. We were just having an argument with an Uber driver the other day. <laughs> As we do. As, As one we does. Do, you know, because we can't shut up. we can't shut up and just take an opinion we don't agree with. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, I hope she's going to see this, but she was, she was like, uh, she was like, yeah, Austin used to be weird, but now it's all messed up. We were like, oh, are you from here? She was like, no. no when did you get here? Oh, like 10 years ago. And I was like, well, I was just like, you know. <laughs> like, should I stay quiet someone... or should I lean into yeah. this argument? And then what I said was, well, you know, I'm from Oakland. And when somebody tells me that they've been in Oakland 10 years, I think they are a gentrifier. Mm. You know what I'm like that, so you're positioning in this, and I now live in Los Angeles, and I'm for sure a gentrifier, but I've been there about 10 years. Mm. You know, and so like your your positioning in the in the transition of a city has a lot to do with that and those blind spots. And so like the the term gentrification is a real weighted one that we we sort of deal with in the show. But really, it's a show about a family that is uh, dealing with having a family member pulled away from them and being incarcerated, and, and that's what the show is. And the second season starts with uh, one member of the family incarcerated, one member of the family getting out of prison. We're going to talk about that, but the showrunners, I see you showrunners, we give respect to the showrunners, the writers, the directors, well, the writer directors in the back. Jess, um, the, the <laughs> blind spotting, the season two, it leads, 
it it leans, <laughs> it leans in. It leans in with the movie had music had musical interludes. It's a musical rich cast, but this season in particular, the, the fantasy element. And I feel like in season two, you flex with the fantasy, the the, the type of interludes, the music. That decision to go more bold in that direction for this season to expand on the themes mm -hmm. I, I, it had to be a very deliberate choice, and it, it worked beautifully in the episodes that I saw. <laughs> uh, they're all looking because they know that I'm incre incredibly shy, so speaking right now is incredibly difficult. Uh, You're doing that, a great job. That, that, that was a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, but I think, I mean, uh, kind of like what Rafa said, but before, I think in, in season one, I think we were just trying to figure out, like, is this even possible? Like, do we even know if we can pull it off? And in season two, we definitely were like, okay, now that we kind of understand a little bit how to make a, tele a television show, like, let's, let's double down on everything that, mm. that makes Oakland so unique and special, and let's showcase that. And so that's... And it shows, and it do. shows, in the, and yeah. you're like, oh, they like us. They gave us a budget. <laughs> <laughs> we could just, yeah. let's, let's yeah. even flex harder. Yeah. Uh, and Keith, uh, as the producer on this show, you know, the movie, for those who haven't seen it, but it should focus on these two, mm -hmm. these two guys, they're friends. And then the show, says, okay, let's expand the universe and focus on Ashley and her kid and her friends. And the, the focus then pivots, you're still there, don't worry. <laughs> you get the money, you get the executive producer and you're still in the show. But how are you able to expand on the themes that they brought up by focusing on Ashley's character? No, I think with the film, because we were so hyper-focused as a film on the two characters of, of Miles and Colin, the film ends up <clears throat> dealing a lot with masculinity and, and issues of kind of male friendship and, and, and the drama and trauma that comes within that dynamic. And we realized that told really only half the story or maybe less than half the story of what the area, what Bay Area is like and Oakland is like and what these families would go through. And when we were making the TV show, it was a really conscious choice to focus primarily on, on women, like at, at the core of the show. Um, you know, I feel weird as the dude here saying that, but Don't that worry, is the focus on it. Yeah. No, but Jasmine, the, one of the women here, the family, as, as one of the stars of the show, you're dealing with, uh, and I don't think I'm spoiling anything, your partner is incarcerated, mm -hmm. you're raising uh, mm -hmm. a son, uh, you move into your partner's mom's home, you have a sister-in-law who's a friend and you know, there's tension. But that character in particular, I think what Keith was talking about, for, for so many from that town, from Oakland, mm -hmm. it's such a common story of yeah. moms just trying their best mm -hmm. to get by. And it's the pressure of that to represent that. It's oftentimes not seen, uh, the humanity, the joy. And so you bring all of that. And so I think how do you focus your, your role into being like, okay, I gotta be joyful, soulful, in pain, be a good mom who's a messy mother, <laughs> trying to figure it all out. Oh yeah, and, and, and anchor the show, and represent <laughs> Oakland. Um, I think I've just pulled from many women that have raised me, and mm. that um, I have been around, you know. Um, I've, I've witnessed a lot of really, really strong women mm. that are single mothers, and are Jill of all trades, and mm. do five million things in one day, and kill it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's so important to me to to represent that because you're right you don't see a lot of stories you don't see a lot of um, stories that represent these women who are basically superheroes you know they're not they don't have these but they're not superheroes that's the thing right they're expected mm. to be superheroes even though they're just people and and they they rise to the occasion yeah but we also we also like shine a light on these like fake superheroes with like these magical powers, but it's like they are the real superheroes. <laughs> Black know? women are, yeah. <laughs> are the superheroes of America. <laughs> I have heard. Listen. Let me lean into this. Listen, yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's, I, I just pulled from a lot of what I've, I've witnessed growing up and, you know, it's, representing my love my love for them and and to be able to translate that in into ashley um is is an honor the the show reflects it uh and and the best thing is it's the superheroes who are trying their best just to be human and survive and live but they're expected to do so much and in an environment like oakland which oftentimes people 
don't know. People are just struggling. Like, you know, incarceration, poverty, it affects generations. You see brilliance rise, and you see brilliance rise out of hustle. And that's mm -hmm. where I want to bring in Jalen, your character, <laughs> Trish. She, I mean, I say this as, as, she's a hustler. She's an entrepreneur. And in the second season, as a result of the hustle that she puts in the end of season one, she's seeing some of the flowers come about, I think, in season two. And I think your character represents that creativity that, like as a friend told me one time, it's, it's the flower that blooms from concrete. Yes. Mm. Right? And so can you explain that with your character? I'm going to get you. Yeah, so, <laughs> you I'm going to get yeah. you. Uh, but Trish, uh, Trish well, Jalen, your character, Trish, how does she represent that, that flower that blooms that people, oh, we want to see her as an entrepreneur. But if you think about it, she's an entrepreneur. She's hustling. She's created something that is now an actual business. And, no, and people would have written her off people would have written her off in real life. And I think that's what's so important about Trish is that she's able to express herself freely. And Helen Hunt, you know, she has this, they have such a great dynamic where she's like kind of hippie, you know, moves around a lot. And then, you know, she raised Trish to be like this flower, like you said, blooming in concrete. Um, I mean, I think you said it perfectly. I don't really know what else to say. <laughs> this is why they pay me the big money. She's a hustler, like that's one said. falafel she's, sandwich a day, and I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> she's a hustler. And I think what's cool about Trish is that she's representing so many different women in America right now, mm. and especially within the black and um, Latina community, that she just gets to be shown and their stories get to be told. Candace, uh, you, you went trying to lean in twice. Uh, I know. And you are Bay Area adjacent. Let's give some <laughs> yeah. respect to Sacramento. Hey, we'll give some <laughs> a small golf clap to North Sacramento <laughs> and the Sac Kings. I did that for you, Candace. I did that for you. It was painful for me, but I did it. Um, <laughs> your character represents, I, I think, so, without giving too much, black women who they're doing everything well, they make it, and then life hits them. And, yeah. And, 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 and they still find a way. I think it's for all the characters. And I think without spoilers, the second season comes in and you're like, oh, things are going well. Uh, yeah. And to find that resilience. So your character comes there as part of this community and this dynamic. And that story of black resilience yes. in Oakland, can you talk about that? Especially when it comes to your character and this show. Oh, can I talk about black resilience? How much time we got, you know? <laughs> How much time do we have? I mean, like, <laughs> uh, yeah, is that, <laughs> uh, Yeah, for sure. That is something that I very much love about Janelle. Um, which I personally connect to a lot is that her surviving and overcoming and having that strength and still finding the joy even within all of her struggle and making the choice to do something bold and brave like go live in a foreign country for five years. That takes a lot of courage to do that, especially where she comes from, you know. Um, black resilience, like, that's what I'm saying, we don't really have time to get into that, but it's just, it really is a staple of mm. us as a people, as a culture, like we overcome mm. everything and even with us having to overcome, us to still have joy as the centerpiece, us to still be able to support, us to still be able to show up for those that we love and who we riding for, that's a special kind of people, yeah. you know? And um, I'm grateful to be able to portray a character like that in this amazing show. Oh, look at that. Hey. That's, that, that's the clip for Instagram. Uh, <laughs> speaking about resilience and speaking about a story that it's an American story, but we don't talk about it. America incarcerates more people mm -hmm. than any other country on earth, two million people. And that's not even talking about the people who then leave and are seen as felons. And that doesn't even talk about the, the, the damage and impact it does on the families, the communities, and the generations. And I mentioned this before earlier in the week. My parents were incarcerated mm -hmm. uh, in the Bay Area, both of them at the same time. I was in my 20s. And when I see incarcerated people depicted, you're either the punchline or the villain. Mm -hmm. and, and Benjamin's character in particular is incarcerated for some of the most absurd, mm -hmm. without giving too many spoilers, like he shouldn't be in prison, mm -hmm. but he, gets, he goes to prison as so many young people do. And then he gets out and in the second season, he's trying to reintegrate. And that's a story that so many P Americans know, but no one talks about. And Benjamin is vulnerable and he's soft-spoken, he's the exact opposite of the super predator that people have demonized. And, and, and you bring that beautifully, that's, that soul to the character, Benjamin. Bringing that reality of so many people and so many families, uh, how did you make the decision to be like, I'm gonna play this character in this particular way that adds layers that are not seen? Um, unfortunately, uh, I figured out how to do that because I've experienced the very thing you've just said. You know, I'm, 
I know people who've been in prison, people who are close to me, family members, and they are not uh, the monsters that the prison system tries to make them into. And I do believe that that is what the system in part is intended to do, is to create people who we can uh, scapegoat and point the blame at. So really the decision came from looking at people around me who had to go through that experience and seeing just how normal and lovely and beautiful they still are. Mm. And, um, and wanting everyone to know that before they ever knew that they had a stint in jail. You know, it's like, I, I wish that people knew this friend of mine or this cousin of mine um, held so much beauty or was so soft-spoken or had this beautiful, stupid smile that they would have when they get surprised. I wish they could see that, uh, but they won't because what they'll interpret or what they'll see first, when you look at a job sheet or when you, when you like, see that rap sheet is you'll see, like, marked. something scary, yeah. So I guess that was my, my hope was just to humanize the people in my life who have helped me to be the human that I am, you know? Um, no, I think it's important because if you do the math, two million people are incarcerated, the people have gotten out, the people with records, everyone has a one degree of separation, right. maybe two. Right. In Oakland, it's, it's less than that. Yeah. And, and we don't talk about it. And there was another uh, show that came here, Unprisoned, with Kerry Washington and Delroy Lindo, that, that Delroy lives in the Bay. Yeah, <laughs> that's, why, that's why he's a cool guy. But uh, and they we call. See, we see you swimming at the Y, Delroy. <laughs> you shape, cuz. That's why he looks good. But do you think this is a moment? Because even that show, it it it, it does. It, Delroy comes out. He's a smooth cat. He comes out like charming and funny. Completely different from what you think. And the decision to show your character as incarcerated and that reality of how do you have a family and how do your kids deal with it. That was a very intentional choice. Why bring this up now, the, the, in this particular season, the, the, the devastating impact of incarceration and humanizing it, Rafael? Oh, um, I mean, I think just to echo a lot of what Ben was just saying, I think we have a, a huge lack of understanding of, of, um, of who exactly is in prison and affected by that system. You said that it's over two million people in the system, but I think it's five million that are part of the entire mm. ecosystem of the prison industrial complex. Um, and I think sometimes we, we talk about that as if it's just this cage that we put people in and not this <coughs> massive part of the American business. Mm. Um, I don't think people understand how many things in their lives are made by inmates. Um, and so I think we're not just talking about, oh, you know, this is what it is to be incarcerated, but the hope is that people zoom out a little bit and go, why do we have the biggest prison population in the world? Um, how does that serve a country that's such a superpower? And I think when you start to sort of pull that thread, you realize like, oh, there's, there's a lot of people, and especially in California, we have, you know, we, we still have a massive prison population that's incarcerated for cannabis, while there's... Well, well, it's legal in other places. Well, people are making millions of dollars. Billionaires everywhere. It's yeah. legal in California. There's people, there's people buying houses next to San Quentin right now with weed money. You know the the irony of that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think the hope for us was to tell just a really small story well about about a, a family that I think defies a lot of people's expectations of who's in prison and who's getting affected by it. So that when you hear it on the news, you no longer have this sort of like mysterious idea of what it is and then you just put all of your assumptions on it. But when they say, you know, someone's just got sent to prison for five years, Ashley pops to mind. Like there's somebody and like that. And her family. And her people and, and the kids and they say, oh, there's a, there's, you know, kids get, you know, kids come in to visit their dads every weekend in the prison. You hear that on the news and it can be very ambiguous. And the show reveals Suddenly it. Suddenly you go, hey, this is what it yeah. looks like. This is how it feels. And even, you know, when we, when we did the movie, I mean, this is a lot of the reason I think that we, you know, that it made sense to also send Miles to prison for this is the movie really makes him feel kind of like he's an angrier guy. He is kind of dangerous and the show sh like breaks that apart. You know, there is like, we use the blind spotting thing between the movie and the show really well of even turning the movie a little bit on its head. Um, and so, and, and then, and the way that that plays out in the show is the, the expectation or the thing that you expect to see when you see an incarcerated um, person and their family are like the, you know, like the Unprisoned show. You expect to see the things that have been portrayed in movies for years and years and years. And now we're starting to see this other wave of it of, no, that's, that's not the lived experience. It looks, um, it looks much more, more nuanced and much more 
personal. And what I uh, really appreciate, there's joy, mm -hmm. there's humor, life goes on, people have to figure their it's ish out. It's a comedy. It is yeah. a comedy. <laughs> Just to be clear. No, no, that's what I'm saying. It's a comedy, yeah. there's music, yeah. there's yeah. flavor in there, and so it's not like a downer show. It's like, unfortunately, this is reality, this is how we live it, this is how we survive it, this is how we do it with joy, we get our presents, we make interesting pinatas that I won't mention. Uh, and, and life, it goes on. Uh, but it's a great show. And congrats to the success. And who would have thought four years later, man? Aww. And Bay Area and Bay Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Line Spotting Season 2 World Premiere is happening tonight at 5 p.m. at the Paramount Theater and coming to stars in April. And you can watch all of our studio interviews on the South by YouTube page at youtube.com slash SXSW. I'm your host, Wajazali. Thanks so much for watching.